Well, Dr. Monty Perry comes to us from the Center of African American Studies at Princeton University. She earned her bachelor's from Yale College, her JD from Harvard University, as well as her PhD. Her interests, she, the interests she has pursued in and out of the educational system have prepared her to reach heights in her disciplines, whether it be law, literary and cultural studies, music, or the social sciences. She has published numerous articles in these areas, many of which are available for download at imaniperry.typepad.com. She also wrote the notes and introduction to the Barnes & Noble's classics edition of the narrative of Sojourner Truth. Professor Perry in teaches interdisciplinary courses that train students to use multiple methodologies to investigate African American experience and culture. For the Twitter fiends in the audience, you can follow her at Imani Perry. And um, for those of you who may be familiar with some of her works or endeavored to investigate them, after hearing her speak, some of her publications include Prophets of the Hood, Pol Politics and Poetics in Hip Hop, Righteous Hope, and More Beautiful and More Terrible, The Embrace of and Transcendence of Racial Inequality in the United States. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Monty Perry. Um, thank you um, for that lovely introduction. Um, and good morning. It's lovely to be here with you all. Um, I'm going to start with, with a question before I go into my talk, because um, it will relate to what I say. Um, who would you all say is the most powerful woman in the world? Me? Hmm? Myself. Okay. <laughs> so I need to stay next to you. <laughs> you said Michelle Obama. Hmm? Asada. Asada. Yeah. Pardon? Hillary Clinton. Hillary Clinton. Wonderful. Okay, this is great because all of these, this, this all um, speaks precisely. Where am I? I have a bad habit with microphones. You have to tell me if I start to do things that make the sound um, get messed up or I do strange things. Sometimes I speak into the light at the podium when I'm teaching. and mm -hmm. So just um, let me know. So all this will, will relate to what I'm going to um, talk about. Second question. How many of you all have read um, Nella Larson's Quicksand? I know there's a lot of English majors in it. Okay. Okay, so at the beginning of um, Nella Larson's 1928 Harlem Renaissance novel, Quicksand, we re read the following description of her room. Helga Klein, uh, of, the, of the protagonist's room. Helga Crane sat alone in her room, which at that hour, eight in the evening, was in soft gloom. Only a single reading lamp, dimmed by a great black and red shade, made a pool of light on the blue Chinese carpet, on the bright covers of the books, which he had, she had taken down from their long shelves, on the white pages of the opened ones selected, on the shining brass bowls crowded with the many-colored nasturtiums beside her on the low table, and on the oriental silk which covered this stool at her slim feet, it was a comfortable room, furnished with rare and intensely personal taste, flooded with southern sun in the day, but shadowy just then with the, with the drawn curtains and single-shaded light. And um, a paragraph or two later, we read a description of Helga herself and her attire, Quote, in vivid green and gold negligee and glistening brocaded mules deep sunk in the big high-backed chair against whose tapestry her sharply cut face with skin like yellow satin was distinctly outlined, she was, to use a hackneyed word, attractive. In the African-American tradition, attire and grooming have historically been part and pa parcel of an argument about the value and even celebration of the self. Notwithstanding the degradations and assumed inferiority of black people that has framed so much of our history on these shores, we like to get fresh, be clean, be sharp. We see it in the lace bonnets and carefully draped shawls in the pictures of Sojourner Truth, in the enormous archive of Ida B. Wells' um, photographs and who seemed clearly quite fond of her own beauty, uh, in the midst of fighting against lynching and Jim Crow, often with a bounty on her head. This attention to grooming is also of, often marked by the kind of cosmopolitan sensibility that we see in the literature of the Harlem Renaissance by Larson and others. And I mean cosmopolitanism in the sense of bearing a sophistication with things beyond one's immediate environment in, in um, grooming um, and, and attention to, and to um, furnishings, as in the Chinese lampshade and brocaded mules of Helga Crane. 
It has ranged from the glitzy sequin and satin glamour of the blues queens to the conservative navy and black of church ladies wearing Etienne Agne shoes. Um, in earlier lectures that I've given, I've noted that part of what has been so appealing for the, about the Obama family for so much of African America is actually the visual image of a kind of black elegance rarely seen uh, outside of our communities on Sunday mornings, um, and that image being spread internationally. Uh, in particular, Michelle Obama stands as a signpost of this kind of black formal elegance today. Um, and both cosmopolitan in the sense of traveling the world, but also in wearing her cosmopolitanism. So she's drawn attention to designers from Asian and Latin America, as well as African American designers like no other first lady has. Um, and in contrast to, main, to media and often um, website images of her, which portray her as a monkey, or as a radical black nationalist, you see this often in comments on websites, which to some conservative minds, there's, there's virtually no difference between monkeys and na black nationalists. Um, she cuts, in contrast to those images, she cuts an impressively polished figure. Um, and black American women have grown so attached to it um, that <laughs> In the rare image of her, like there are certain times when her hair is not fully pulled together, she's casual, and you see in comments on those web pages, disappointed. I'm so disappointed in, in how she appears today. Um, so appearance remains this kind of political terrain for black Americans um, in, in, in many arenas. And I talked a little bit last night about how the polit politics of hair. Um, um, but, in, but certainly even in the kind of conservative attire and the kind of elegant attire that Michelle Obama um, embraces. And I have to admit, as much as I love the image of a striking black woman marvelously turned out, I've grown tired of the attention to it. Um, particularly, I see this in, in my friends' postings on Facebook, right, all the time. Um, and part of the feminist in me notes that the fixation on her skirt suits and perfect coifs, the references to her being a black version of Jackie Onassis, the way we've idealized her marriage, which by any reasonable human consideration must be enormously challenging, um, has a suggestion of a kind of throwback idealization. Um, but much more troubling than that, I think, um, is the way in which the spectrum of black female heroines and our understanding of them in terms of ideals and role models and, lead and leaders um, has contracted. So the range of, of images of who that might be, so Mrs. Obama or Oprah or Beyonce, right? Women who are remarkable for their wealth and status and visibility um, had their images proliferated on magazine covers and, uh, and the like in articles. And uh, I'm concerned about the narrowness of those kinds of images. And so that's not a critique of these women, but of the way in which these women stand in as models of black female achievement, both internal and external to black communities in the United States and across the globe. Right? So I want to talk a little bit about Michelle Obama's visit to South Africa with her daughters. And in many of the articles about last year, in many of the articles about the visit um, in the US press, she was cited as an important role model for South African girls. And on the one hand, I can understand how that would be, um, you know, that in terms of being accomplished and being a, this uh, international figure, and also um, her, the kind of visual image um, that she presents for poor <coughs> girls in townships of South Africa, right? Um, on, and also seeing a brown-skinned woman um, standing in as, uh, um, as a representative of the most powerful nation. Uh, on the earth. Now the messages that uh, Mrs. Obama gave in her speeches to South Africa um, was, it was, was attentive to what South Africa's role was in the world. And she talks about the history of it as being a role model for the world. She described the interconnected struggles between South African and the United States. And she focused on women's leadership in South Africa. And I want to quote a portion of the speech. She said, you can be the generation that brings opportunity and prosperity to forgotten corners of the world and banishes hunger from this continent forever. You can be the generation that ends HIV AIDS in our time, the generation that fights not just the disease but the stigma of the disease, the generation that teaches the world that HIV is fully preventable and treatable and should never be a source of shame. You can be the generation that holds your leaders accountable for open, honest government at every level. 
government that stamps out corruption and protects the rights of every citizen to speak freely, to worship openly, to love whomever they love. You can be the generation to ensure that women are no longer second-class citizens, that girls take their rightful places in our schools. You can be the generation that stands up and says that violence against women in any form, in any place, including the home, especially the home, that isn't just a woman's rights violation, it's a human rights violation, and it has no place in any society. You see, that is the history that your generation can make. Make a change, right? It's a beautiful speech and was inspiring in many ways. And she also, in various parts of it, pays um, appropriate deference to South Africa's um, tradition of freedom fighting and world transforming. And yet, as um, journalist Anissa Haddadi wrote for the International Business Times, the inspiration that she provided failed to consider some real social realities in South Africa. Um, she wrote, the First Lady often uses herself as an example for success, and as hard as she must have worked to become a highly successful woman, the America she grew up in and South Africa are completely different and do not provide for the same types of opportunities, especially in terms of access to education. The problem in Africa is not that children do not think they can do things, it is usually that their socioeconomic positions stop them from doing them at a very early age. Moreover, while the access to antiretroviral drugs is widely and often freely accessible in developed countries, the same cannot be said of developing countries, especially in Africa, where most states suffer medicine shortages and even patients who manage to access treatment are left periods of times without any medicines. Now, these overwhelming majority of girls, um, of the overwhelming majority of the girls to whom Michelle Obama spoke, will not, no matter how hard they work, be anything like Michelle Obama or Oprah. The overwhelming majority of girls, even in my home, near my home in North Philly or West Philly, won't either. Right? So there's something that needs to be unpacked because in the messaging, because there's something awry in the messaging. There's also something awry in the messaging that's attached to how we talk about gender in this context. Um, so there was this talk about women in South Africa and, and claiming a women's want future for girls and women in South Africa. Now, little known to most Americans, South Africa far outpaces the United States in representation of women in politics. So um, South Africa is number four in the world in terms of gender equality in government. And in 1994, they leapt from a position of 141 to number eight, and they did so because the African National Congress adopted a 30% quota on its party list. 30% of its representatives had to be women. Number one in political e gender equality in government, Rwanda. Mozambique is number 10. Anybody guess where the United States is? <laughs> Close, 90. Yeah. The reason the United States trails these other countries is complicated, but at least one factor is that we've never had either a quota system or an affirmative action program for women in elected office in this country. Um, at most, we've had foundations that encourage women to run for political office and the like. <clears throat> and add to this the disparities in wealth, um, historically, that have a significant role in politics in the United States because, as we know, whoever has the most money usually wins elections now in this country. Um, so, so that even wealthy women um, in the U.S. are likely to trace their wealth to the paternal line and, and the transfer of wealth focuses, uh, and for those in, in, in politics, often focuses on um, men. And in the United States, generally speaking, um, as I said before, the one who spends the most is the one who wins the election. On the other hand, in the context of higher education and professional employment, we've been more, far more successful than many nations um, and then, then we have in politics in addressing gender divides, in part because we've had affirmative action in education. Now that's initial, that was an initial um, uh, movement. The reality is now that in every um, ethnic group besides Asian Americans, women outperform men. And that's one of the things that often falls outside, out of the discourse about affirmative action, which I always say something we should keep in our pockets. Affirmative action is practiced in higher education for white males routinely because they underperform relative to white females. And so in order to do gender balances in colleges, they get, um, it's a little bit easier for them to get in so, uh, with, with lower grades on average. So the same thing that's happening for Latinos and African Americans. It's not as dramatic, but um, the same thing has happened. So the only uh, ethnic group where there's really parity along across um, gender lines are for Asian Americans. <coughs> 
or rather racial group, not ethnic group. Um, now, <clears throat> in contrast to where we are, um, to say a little bit more about politics in South Africa, South Africa has nine of its 27 cabinet members and eight of, of its 14 deputy ministers being women. The Speaker of the National Assembly is a woman, a Chairman of the National Council of Provinces is a woman, etc. So when we do this comparison, the landscapes according to, to gender across um, nation state, we have to be really a, a lot more careful than we generally are. Right? And we talk about the role of women. Um, so we can't assume that our image about the suffering of women in other nations is a neat picture. Right? <clears throat> but another piece of what I want to say is that um, it's something about, and I use this term in the title of the talk, um, neoliberalism, and in what I call neoliberal feminism, which is that we have these images of women as <coughs> sort of figures who we sort of idealize, wealthy and powerful women, but we often don't ask bigger questions about the way their role functions in relationship to women at large in a society or the policies that affect women's lives. This is obviously not a race-specific problem. This is and not even a specifically American problem, although it is um, a, a phenomenon in, in developed nations. Um, and now, when I want to talk, and it's a problem with feminism at the present age, and I want to talk about it, but I want to give you a little bit of a definition of neoliberalism, and then move to think of, talk about what I mean by feminist neoliberalism, and then give some um, discussions of alternative images of women that might be um, useful for how we think about an idea of feminism or gender equality, or whatever word that you want to use. Um, so, what is neoliberalism? It's a set of economic policies that at present are, are, are embraced by both Democrats and Republicans um, that have become gained in popularity over the past 25 years. It has a core set of, of, of beliefs. One is that markets are almost always better than any bureaucratic structures um, and should be brought into everything. So for example, the argument that charter schools are better than regular public schools because they foster competition or um, <coughs> that or um, uh, pr private prisons are better because we can have a competition between who can be more efficient and the like. Um, it pushes um, cutting expenditures for social services and the safety net for the poor. So we can see as an example of that the welfare reforms of 1996 under President Clinton. It allows for the deregulation of all kinds of markets and pushes for privatization of utilities companies, of prisons, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and most importantly for this talk, um, neoliberalism is an idea in which the I is, is, a, is a theory in which the idea of the public good or the community is a kind of diminished and we focus instead on individual achievement and accomplishment. <coughs> so it's sort of we're not focused much on the public good. It's sort of the contrast to an idea of, you know, it's not what your country can do for you, it's what you can do for your country, that kind of um, philosophy doesn't have a lot of cachet or doesn't have a lot of purchase anymore. So when I say feminist neoliberalism, I mean a sense of feminism that's rely that relies upon the marketization of an image of a power woman who achieves on her own, as opposed to necessarily being in service to large numbers of people. Um, and, and doesn't necessarily have to be to, to um, have a particular relationship to communities in order to take on the name of a feminist, right? Um, so we, we tend to focus on individuals um, who have attained success or status rather than individuals who have expanded opportunity or fairness for large numbers of people. So if we think about the range of contemporary black female heroes or leaders that, that, that are public, I think we're hard pressed to find those who don't fit in the box of a kind of individual attainment or um, a success or status as opposed to um, those, that, which is why I appreciated um, the range of, of suggestions because there's sort of, there's an, it suggests to me there's this effort to grapple with thinking about, you know, what, what idea of power we really want to, to embrace. Um, and I th but I think in general, right, there's, there's a, you know, there's a, there's a narrow range um, and that's because of the way that they're vehicles for the distribution of images that give us a certain kind of representative over and over again, right? Um, but we ought to think about the way that those who we see as representatives eclipse the work of many others, teachers, community activists, local representatives, right? Um, and, uh, 
and sort of push against a, a, against uh, a narrow conception of, of who operates as powerful and role model and leader. Now, let me be clear, I believe that, I, I don't suggest that they, these individuals are not role models, um, but that, that we need to sort of embrace models of group achievement quite explicitly. Um, so I'm going to talk briefly, let me just go back in history for a moment, um, to 1863, way back in the midst of the Civil War. Um, and in the midst of the Civil War, Harriet Tubman devises an important wartime tactic. And it's recounted in the Boston newspaper, The Commonwealth. And they describe um, um, that she, um, it, I'll, I'll read part of the, the newspaper quote. Colonel Montgomery and his gallant band of 300 black soldiers under the guidance of a black woman, Harriet Tubman, dashed into the enemy's country, struck a bold and effective blow, destroying millions of dollars worth of commissary stores, cotton and lordly dwellings, and striking terror into the hearts of rebeldom, brought off near 800 slaves and thousands of dollars worth of property without losing a man or receiving a scratch. It was a glorious consummation. After they were all fairly well disposed of in the Beaufort charge, they were addressed in strains of thrilling eloquence by their gallant deliverer, to which they responded in a song, There is a white robe for thee, a song so appropriate and so heartfelt and cordial as to bring unbidden tears. Okay. The colonel was followed by a speech from the black woman who led the raid and under whose inspiration it was originated and conducted, Harriet Tubman. For sound and sense and real native eloquence, her address would do honor to any man, and it created a great sensation. <clears throat> and then this is the, that was the Kambahi River Raid. Right? Um, in the 1970s, the Kambahi River Collective, a black feminist organization in Boston, took its name from this historic raid. And they published the Kambahi River Collective Statement in 1979, which was to become one of the most important statements in the history of black feminist thought. In the statement, they address not simply the concerns of black women, but the various means by which people are excluded and oppressed and marginalized, race, class, sexual orientation, gender, and nationality. They pushed us to figure out how to organize through these differences while understanding the inherent importance and value of black women and honoring the historic, historic struggles of black women to improve the societies in which they live. There is something in the way of that thinking about the meaning and importance of a black feminist politic with an international dimension and a racial justice politic with an international dimension that I think we need to draw from these, that we need to draw upon um, at present. So I want to talk in contrast for a moment about a different kind of idea of prominent woman presently. Um, so how many people are, have, are aware of who the president, the current prime minister of Jamaica is? Right. Okay, so the current Prime Minister of Jamaica is a woman, Portia Simpson Miller. She's the second, only the second head of government to openly endorse republicanism and replace the position of the monarch. So the Queen of England still has a role. It's, it's largely um, a cultural and symbolic leadership role, but she still, they still uh, um, pay some degree of obeisance to the Queen, um, now 50 years after independence. Um, so she has, has, has argued that instead that there needs to be a republic, there needs to be an elected person who takes on that role, and she plans to do this on the 50th anniversary of Jamaican independence, which is later on this year, in August of this year. Much more dramatically, however, she's the first head of government in Jamaican history to formally endorse civil rights for lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender citizens, and she did so during an election campaign. Now, Jamaica is notorious for the persecution of gay, gay Jamaicans, so much so that um, it can be a cause for political asylum for people who are coming from Jamaica to the United States. So this is physical. This is not sort of uh, religious or political, but this is physical danger, right? So Portia um, Simpson Miller, in her campaign, um, says, comes out in support of, of recognition of rights. Um, so Miller has listened to the suffering of a portion of her, of her community, of her, of her nation. Um, in Stacey Ann Chin's memoir, The Other Side of Paradise, she's a Jamaican poet who was on the Deaf Poets show on HBO for, for a long period of time. And in this memoir, The Other Side of Paradise, she describes growing up in Jamaica, a poor girl from the countryside, and um, how after both of her parents um, 
abandon her. Her grandmother nurtures and protects her and her brother, but then she be, she's separated from her grandmother and brother because of financial constraints, and so she's forced into this, um, this household of distant relatives. And while there, she's sexually abused and she's mistreated. And in the final section of the memoir, she recounts a series of uh, violent assaults and threats that she faces after she comes out as a lesbian, and she ultimately escapes um, to New York City. And she writes, um, I write poetry to survive the dance of being home and not home, of being freer but not free. And so I think, you know, for me as someone who works with literature and who is trying to think internationally, um, Prime Minister Simpson Miller's response, response to Stacey Inchin's voice with her governmental policy, despite it maintaining, uh, despite it remaining a very unpopular position in her nation. In another part of the African diaspora, Brazil, another woman, Dilma Rousseff is president. Um, although she grew up as part of Brazil's um, small, white, upper middle class, she was radicalized in her youth. Um, according to Rousseff, it was um, during high school um, when she was at a Catholic girls' school, um, she became aware of the political situation in her country getting into, quote, very subversive activities and realizing, quote, that the world was not a place for debutantes. So she um, transformed herself. She became a socialist and an activist. She was subject to torture um, before the political tide turned in Brazil. Now, um, I should say, I don't agree with all of President Rousseff's positions on issues regarding women, um, but she speaks in a way that is responsive to the idea that to fight for women means to fight on their behalf in terms of community. Um, she's a member of the Social Democratic Party, and they generally just oppose neoliberalism and privatization, but at times she's decided to give over government agencies to private enterprises because it enables the modernization of parts of the country that otherwise they couldn't modernize, right? New power plants and roads, new airports for the upcoming World Cup games, and they're significantly cheaper than if she tried to do them through the public works. But in contrast to the standard logic or conversation under neoliberalism, she's planned to extend the social welfare network, and much of the world where welfare is not a dirty word, um, saying that under her rule, quote, Brazil will continue to grow with social inclusion and mobility. Um, but I also want to cite what she said before the UN General Assembly, um, quote, Besides representing my dear Brazil, I feel here today that I stand representing all women in the world, those who suffer from hunger and cannot provide food to their children, those who suffer violence both at their job and in their family lives, and those who have been bold and conquered the power that allows me to be here today. Now, I don't say that to represent Brazil as a panacea of any sort. Poverty, domestic violence, gender inequality, racial inequality, and both education and access to property are all enormous problems in that nation. My point is just that to think about opening our ears and eyes to ways of imagining feminism and leadership and gender justice and women role models beyond what we see on um, mainstream media outlets on a daily basis. And we have to do so by embracing a kind of cosmopolitanism that's rooted in a sense of sophistication about the politics of other nations as well as our own, right? Um, and that's, I think, a kind of sophisticated transnational feminism that understands that there are specific challenges of each nation state, that we can't have presumptions about what's going on in other places. Um, and in terms of the language of philosophy, I root this in, in what we call um, recognition. And recognition is a political philosophical term, and it simply means recognizing, seeing someone in order to give them a stake in the political society, but really goes to deeper meaning of recognizing another person as possessed of humanity, as someone who has the range of emotions, capacity for decency and love, irrespective of the package in which they come, accidents and accidents of birth. And I think in many ways, um, Toni Morrison has been a philosophical standard bearer, even though she is a literary figure um, for me in this regard. Um, and in nearly every one of Toni Morrison's novels, it's really uh, an important um, theme to notice that there are spaces made for groups of women, not, indiv not just individuals, but for groups of women to work out their experiences together. And these groups act as healers, as communities, as protectors. So in um, Beloved, there's an escape, uh, the escaped woman, slave woman, Setha, 
kills her, tries to kill all of her children, and effectively kills one child in an effort to protect her from enslavement when the slave catchers come, have come from her. And later when the baby comes back to haunt her and slowly sucks away every bit of her spirit, it's the larger community of women who first punish her for such a horrific act and then later restore her to community and save her from the destructive haunting. But I want to end um, with uh, actually another voice in the novel Beloved, and that's of Baby Suggs. And it's a, a sermon that she delivered to the newly free community um, in which she lives. Um, and I think it, it, it sort of captures all of what I'm saying about how to be attentive to, to what the idea of, of feminism or sort of gender liberatory politics or concern with others um, we, should be, we should be focused on. Baby Suggs called to the women, called the women to her. Cry, she told them, for the living and the dead, just cry. And without covering their eyes, the women let loose. It started that way, laughing children, dancing men, crying women, and then it got mixed up. Women stopped crying and danced. Men sat down and cried. Children danced. Women laughed. Children cried until, exhausted and riven, all in each lay about the clearing, damp and gasping for breath. In the silence that followed, Baby Suggs, holy, offered up to them her great big heart. Here, she said, in this here place, we flesh, flesh that weeps, laughs, flesh that dances on bare feet and grass, love it, love it hard. Yonder they do not love your flesh, they despise it. No more do they love the skin on your back, yonder they flay it. And oh, my people, they do not love your hands. Those they only use, tie, bind, chop off, and leave empty. Love your hands, love them. Raise them up and kiss them, touch others with them. Pat them together, stroke them on your face because they don't love that either. You got to love it, you, and know they ain't in love with your mouth. Yonder out there, they will see it broken and break it again. What you say out of it, they will not heed. What you put into it to nourish your body, they will snatch away and give leavings instead. No, they don't love your mouth, you got to love it. This is flesh I'm talking about here, flesh that needs to be loved, feet that need to rest and to dance, backs that need support, shoulders that need arms, strong arms, I'm telling you. And oh, my people out yonder, hear me, they do not love your neck unnoosed and straight, so love your neck, put a hand on it, grace it, stroke it, and hold it up. And all your inside parts that they just as soon slop for hogs, you got to love them. The dark, dark liver, love it, love it, and the beat and beating heart, love that too more than eyes or feet, more than your life-holding womb and your life-giving private parts. Hear me now, love your heart, for this is the prize. Saying no more, she stood up then and danced with her twisted hip the rest of what her heart had to say while the others opened their mouths and gave her the music, long notes held until the four-part harmony was perfect enough for their deeply loved flesh. Thank you.